Please be seated. Reading this morning from Paul's first letter to the people in the city of Corinth, a new Christian community, and hear these words of challenge and exhortation that he shares with them. <coughs> now, the following instructions I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will become clear who among you are genuine. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry, and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as, as you can eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves. And only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, Wait for one another. If you are hungry, eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for your convenience or condemnation. About the other things, I will give instructions when I come. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. September 11th, 2001. You're old enough in this congregation to remember that day. You know what a terrible day it was. <laughs> Terrorist attack in the United States of America. Terrorist attack the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center and other places around our country. It's an awful day. A terrible day. A day we will never, ever forget. One of those moments in time for those of us who were living in those days can tell you exactly where we were and what we were doing when we first heard the news of the attacks. In recent weeks, I've been drawn again to all the documentaries that have been played regarding September 11, 2001. One of the documentaries portrayed the day before, a day when America was, well, lived the way we're used to living, would never live that way again. There were documentaries about the terrorists themselves that, that traced every step they made. There were days leading up to that that they trained and they prepared and it showed the resolve to do harm to this country. Then there were documentaries of the day itself and the terrible tragedy, the heroic things that were done, lives that were lost, last words that people shared with their loved ones. 
I watched them all again, and I relived that day, and it, it, it broke my heart in two once again as I, I, I watched and I, I saw and remembered all the terrible things that happened. But as I thought about this, and, and maybe there's one out there, I did not see a documentary on the days after 9-11. Maybe there's one out there, I just missed it. But on the day of 9-11, you may recall that you saw images of people. People, black and white and brown. People from different nations and various ethnicities and, and nationalities praying. And then in the days after, you may recall those of us who are around, may recall how this country turned to God. How our churches were full during those days following 9-11. How you couldn't go down the street without seeing images and signs or hearing words of encouragement on the radio about praying for our country. Praying that God would bless America. I think back to those days and, and it, it, it strikes me that maybe, just maybe, we got a glimpse of what God wants us to be. How God wants all of His people to be united in, in His faith or in their faith for Him. How we as a country came together seeking a God who was a God of hope and a God of peace. A country that was united in some way. If even just for a brief time. Oh, in 14 years, how divided we have become. People hate one another. Denominations divided. Families divided. Churches divided. <clears throat> Makes us wonder if we really can be united in anything at all. And then this past week, once again, hate raises its ugly head. In an institution of learning where, where individuals are there, with the last thing on their mind being violence, the last thing on their mind being the fact that they could possibly lose their lives, but into this setting of learning comes this individual with hate in his heart. This individual who opens fire on individuals in the classrooms, killing, hurting, changing lives of family members and individuals forever. And all and in all things. For the most part we're hearing it was about what his victims believed. Do you believe in God? Are you a Christian? Then you're dead. because an individual was fed up with religion. And he decided to express his hatred in firing guns into classrooms. And Jesus wept. Jesus wept. One day, near the end of his ministry, Jesus stood over to looking out over that great city, that holy city. And the tears came to his eyes because he realized how divided that city was. A city that had rejected his ministry. A city that had rejected his, his, his passion and his, his mercy and his care and his love. A city that had seen him work miracles and do great things, but yet they rejected him. They would not accept his message of peace. And as he looked over that city, he saw a city divided by those who would follow him and by those who on the other extreme wanted to kill him. And he stood there as he wept and he said, Oh, if I could just take you under my wing as a mother again takes its flock under its wings and love you and care for you. As 
Jesus looks out of our country and over our world. Does he leave this morning? Jesus said to the people of Jerusalem then, and he says to us now, if you, even you, had only recognized in this day the things that made for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. I think that resonates with each one of us in some way. If you, only you, would accept my love and my compassion. If you, only you, would accept my grace and mercy. If you, only you, would accept my understanding of love for all people, our world would be a different place. There would be peace on this earth. There would be peace in our communities, in our churches, in our denominations.
And we not only had supper, oh, it was so good. We talk amongst the family members, we share things. But in the end, my father, me and my father, we would have devotional time at the table. Anybody ever had devotion time at the family supper table? We did. We had family devotions. He would even, before we had prayer, make us sing together as a family. We would sing little prayer courses before we had our time of prayer together. All of that was well and good until we invited friends over to have supper with us. <laughs> They'd always look at us like, man, your family's crazy. <laughs> but that's just the way it was. Every time we shared a meal, we not only shared in communion with family, we shared in communion with our Heavenly Father. Amen. Some of you may have similar experiences in your background, but very few this day and time have similar experiences now, do we? We're so busy. We're so rushed. We don't have time to have dinner together. We spend more time waiting in line for the drive to prepare our food than we have time in fellowship with friends and family members around the table. It's just the way things are. It's broken down. We don't share meals that much anymore. In some regard, some would say, well, I'm concerned about the breakdown of the family. I would say to you, I think it started with the breakdown of family meals. That time we had around the table and sharing with each other, encouraging each other, other, hearing each other's concerns. In fact, I read recently that for children and teens, having dinner together with parents and family is a strong predictor of academic success, psychological adjustment, lower rates of alcohol abuse, drug use, early sexual behavior, eating disorders, and risk for suicide. Now, I don't know how factual that is. But it does point to me how important and how relevant and needed a shared meal is together. Yes. Yes. A question that needs to be considered is this. As the way we approach our taking our human attitude with meals, especially shared meals, had an influence on the way that we receive and approach communion. As we receive the, the bread of life, in the cup of grace, do we really take time at this altar to kneel and to pray and to, 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 to really join in that moment and recognize God's presence in that moment? Do we really grasp the understanding that in that moment God's grace and mercy is poured out upon us once again? Do we, do we take the time to, to really understand that as we receive the bread and the cup, we are truly receiving the body and blood of Christ and it becomes a part of who we are and is lived out in all that we say and do? It seems like with communion has become almost taken a leave. Look at our attendance. Now, I know there are a lot of things going on, football games, other things, but a lot of folks are at home today. Why? Because it's communion. We know church is probably going to go long today because, yep, it's going to go long, I can guarantee it. Uh, it's probably going to go long today because we're having communion. So I'm not going to go. And that just takes too much time to share that meal together. It's become like communion. Well, it's like take it or leave it. Take it for granted. It's just a ritual. We don't really need to be a part of it. We must remember that through the Lord's Supper, that through eating and tasting the bread and juice, we're symbolically tasting and receiving God's grace. Every time we receive communion, we should approach the table seeking His forgiveness for our sins, seeking a blessing, desiring to acknowledge God's presence in that moment, and leave the table feeling refreshed, renewed, restored, knowing that we have been in the presence of God, and as a result of this moment that we share the table, we are unified not only with Christ, but unified with all believers who believe that Christ is indeed their Lord and their Savior. But the experience of communion does not end, as the benediction has said. We're called to take that grace and receive and share with others. It's at that point that unity at the table becomes a step towards unity in this world. Sadly to say, it's so easy for us to be divisive. It's so easy for us to be hateful and to bully. It seems like it's so easy to separate ourselves and point to other people as, well, those are the others. But the 
the time we share together this holy meal calls us to a different way of living, a way that rises above all the hatred and all the division, a way of peace and unity, a way of grace and love that reflects the very love of Jesus Christ himself. In really, this, this shared meal draws us towards Christ and his forgiveness and his redemption. But outwardly, it moves us to be in discipleship, to take the message of his sacrifice for us and share with others by living sacrificially for others. And through our actions of sacrificial love and caring, Christ is revealed to them through each one of us. Well, there may be times when Jesus may be heartbroken, heartbroken over the condition of our world, our nation. We also know that the scriptures tell us that there's much joy in heaven. Much joy in heaven when one in the pits. As we share the communion this morning with Christians around the world, come ready to experience God's grace. Allow that grace to wipe away any hatred, any division, any hurt you may have with others. Come to this table and allow this time to mold you, to shape you, to be a time when you truly feel united with Christ, a time when we are united with Christians wherever we are in our faith journeys as His disciples. And take that grace you receive. Leave these doors today to take that same message of grace, love, compassion, forgiveness to everyone you meet. That's taking communion beyond this table. It brings us together so that together we can go in this world and indeed change this world.